Everybody's talking about the rally in US stocks, but the rally in emerging markets has kind of flown under the radar. So in this video, we talk about the reasons behind that rally in emerging market stocks, bonds and currencies, but also whether emerging markets are attractive right now. Then we also consider whether it's worthwhile excluding China from your EM holdings. Now, if you do enjoy our videos, please do subscribe to our channel and like this video. So let's look at the secret rally in emerging markets in a bit more detail. So let's look at the year to date returns from January to July in 2023. And you can see that the US has had a very strong outturn. It's generated 20% returns for the S&P 500 year to date. But it is in the middle of the pack. And if we look at some of the strongest performing markets, well, those are in emerging markets. So Argentina up almost 40%. Poland up 34% and a lot of South American countries like Brazil and Mexico have also had very strong returns, higher than the US in fact. The real basket case in emerging markets so far this year has been China for reasons which are largely political. So why is it that emerging markets are attractive right now? We're going to look through some of the reasons behind this rally but also reasons why they're still attractive. One reason why emerging markets are always more attractive is that their GDP growth is higher. They're growing faster. If we look at the percentage of GDP generated in emerging markets and developed markets, you can see we've had a complete turnaround since 1980. Back then, what we saw was that about two thirds of growth was generated in developed markets, about one third in emerging. Well, around the year 2010, you can see that the two graphs crossed such that we've now got almost a complete reversal. Developed markets now generate about a third of global GDP and emerging generates two thirds. If we look at that same data, but drill into the country by country contributions, you can see that two countries completely dominate and those are China and the US. Now, depending on which year you look at and the specific measure you look at, China is sometimes a bit bigger, which it is in this case, sometimes a bit smaller, but to first order, those are the two big GDP generators. But then you've also got the very long tail of EM countries, which also generate a lot of GDP growth. And here we'd include countries like Indonesia, the Russian Federation, Mexico, Brazil, and so on. Now that GDP growth doesn't always translate into earnings growth for companies due to various reasons. One reason might be corruption. Another reason might be state-owned enterprises, which are not particularly capital efficient and don't always represent the interests of the shareholders first. But it's certainly true that over the long term, what you'd expect is that emerging market higher growth should feed into corporate earnings and should feed into higher returns. Another promising trend in emerging markets at the moment is that there's been a reform of monetary and fiscal policy. For example, Turkey adopted a very unconventional monetary policy in which it cut interest rates in order to fight inflation, the opposite of what most other countries were doing. And that was largely due to interventions into monetary policy by the president, Tayyip Erdogan. However, he seems to have backpedaled on that and now Turkey seems to have adopted more conventional policies. Other countries in emerging markets, particularly in Latin America, have also reined back their fiscal spending, which many bondholders were worried about. Argentina's got an election coming up in which hopefully their policies will also be updated. But overall, what we're seeing is many countries in emerging markets are returning to the fold of more conventional monetary and fiscal policy after being locked out of markets for some time. Now, if you do invest in emerging markets, another tailwind would be if the currencies strengthened. And if we look at which countries' currencies have rallied versus the dollar over the course of 2023, you can see that, again, many emerging market countries, particularly in South America, top that table of strengthening. So the Colombian peso has rallied by around 20%, the Mexican peso as well, the Brazilian real. But in Eastern Europe, we also see the Polish Zloty and the Hungarian Forint rallying versus the dollar. That's after a period of weakening the previous year in 2022. So this is certainly a tailwind if you invest in the equity of those countries, but also the sovereign bonds. But this is also a result of improving outlooks for those countries, either because of policy shifts, 
but also because the Fed's monetary policy tightening, which is usually bad for emerging markets, seemed to have kind of reached its peak for this cycle. And now we're thinking about cuts in rates from the Fed and from other central banks around the world. Another attractive thing about emerging markets is that they're currently cheaper than many developed countries. Now, that's certainly not true of all emerging market countries. Here I've marked the emerging markets as a whole, and you can see that the average price to earnings multiple, which is a measure of expensiveness, is around 12.3 for emerging markets. Now, not all emerging stock markets are cheap. India is particularly expensive, more expensive than the US, in fact. But other large markets like Mexico, China and Brazil are still looking very cheap on this forward price to earnings multiple basis. What does that mean for you as an investor? Well, when markets are cheap, it usually means you have more upside, higher long term returns. And that in particular at the moment makes the US look unattractive. If we break down emerging markets into regions, so here you can see the data from Yardani on forward price to earnings multiple expensiveness for emerging markets as a whole, that's in red, but also EM in Asia, Europe and Latin America. The markets which are really cheap are Eastern Europe. That's been cheap for a long time and it's still cheap, but also Latin America, which was expensive at the end of 2022, but then sold off massively and is now looking very reasonably priced. And if we do look at individual countries like Brazil, India and China, you can see how expensive India is relative to those other two countries. So that begs the question, what has China added to emerging markets? Well, it certainly added a lot of weight. If you look at the size of China within an emerging market index like the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, you can see it makes up about 30% of that market as a whole. The next biggest market is only half as big, that's Taiwan, and India is kind of comparable with Taiwan. You'll notice that South Korea is also included in emerging markets, somewhat oddly. This is because that's how MSCI classifies South Korea. But if we look at the index performance, if we exclude China or include it into emerging markets, you can see that the annualised return since 2000 doesn't look very different. If we include China, the return is 7.8%. Excluding China only removes 0.3% to 7.5. So really, it hasn't added a lot since 2000. And if we compare that with a global index, like the All Country World Index, that's returned less. So that's returned about 5.9% since 2000. So EM has outperformed over those two decades, but China wasn't responsible for a lot of that outperformance. So perhaps excluding it isn't such a big deal after all. So here I've got three funds. I've got a developed market ETF, which is SWDA, and since 2019 that's up by around 45%. But you can see that for the two emerging market funds, one of them is emerging markets excluding China, that's EMXC. It's actually denominated in dollars. Here I've converted it manually to sterling. And the other fund is a pure EM fund, including China. You can see that excluding China would have actually helped you over this period. So I think that's why we've seen fairly big inflows into these EM X China funds recently. And if we look at those returns for those funds year to date, and I've also included the US here, sure, the US has done really well. It's up by 12% in sterling terms. And the MSCI developed market tracker SWDA is mostly US, so the return there is comparable. But you can see the benefit of excluding China, where the return is double that of not excluding China. So there are two trackers in Europe which exclude China, the Lixor MSCI Emerging Markets X China Fund, the very reasonable fee there is 0.15%, and there's also an iShares MSCI EM X China ETF, and the fee there is 0.18%. And the EM X C Fund is also available in the United States. If you want to drill into the story about China and whether its growth story is over, then we did a podcast about that recently on Many Happy Returns. Here you can see it on Apple Podcasts, but you can also get it on Spotify and wherever you like to get your podcast. It's a bit more informal and it's much longer than one of these videos. So if you haven't subscribed to it already, why not have a listen? But it hasn't just been a rally in EM stocks. 
the bond market has also rallied considerably. Now here what I'm talking about are sovereign bonds, bonds issued by governments in emerging markets. And these countries have two choices. They can either issue bonds in their local currency, and you can buy those with the EM local currency bond funds, or you can go for the hard currency version where they've issued in US dollars. So for example, Mexico, instead of issuing bonds in its local currency, the Mexican peso could issue them in US dollars. Now investors like hard currency EM bond funds because there they're not taking the EM currency risk. And if we look at the rally in emerging market sovereign bonds over the course of 2023, you can see the ones which have done best were the ones which were most distressed in 2022, where they sold off a lot. So that would include El Salvador, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Ukraine, Zambia, and also Argentina. Now, partly that's a recovery in the currency, but also consideration of reforms in those countries, but also a relief rally after the huge sell-off last year. And if we look at Latin American sovereign bonds, those have had a great 2023, particularly Colombian sovereign bonds, but also the sovereign bond markets in Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Mexico. Now, one of the things you can do on Coifin is to look at the yield on individual ETFs. And that's what I've done here. This looks at the dividends paid out by the ETFs over the last 12 months, divided by the price of the fund. The blue line is the EMB hard currency EM ETF. So here you're buying hard currency emerging market sovereign bonds. And the yield is typically higher than short duration US treasuries. And there we're looking at the yield of the SHY fund. Now, SHY yields are very much driven by monetary policy. So that reflects the Fed's federal funds target rate. And of course, over the course of this year, the federal funds target rate has skyrocketed upward. That in turn means that the spread, the difference in yield between emerging market sovereign bonds and those very low risk US money market funds or the SHY bond fund has tightened. You're not getting so much additional income for taking EM sovereign bond risk. So that does make those sovereign bonds slightly less attractive. So that is something to bear in mind as interest rates increase in developed markets. So is it worth taking the additional risk of including emerging markets in your portfolio right now? I think it's still true that emerging markets are cheap, so that makes them attractive if we exclude India. And I think excluding China is also quite easy to do now with those ex-China funds and also quite cheap to do. So I think I probably would do that at the moment, given the geopolitical risk around China and its foreign policy. But also I think that the rally in currencies is something to pay attention to, particularly as the Fed is kind of ending its monetary hiking cycle. And if it does start to stabilise its rates or even start cutting them, usually that's a big boon to emerging markets. So that's another thing to consider down the road. So I certainly think I would consider doing this. My core portfolio is, of course, just a global equity market fund, and it excludes emerging markets completely. But for my tactical portfolio, my fund portfolio, I'd certainly consider including emerging markets right now. Now, don't forget, if you do enjoy our content, please do subscribe to our channel and like this video. And as always, thank you for listening.